This episode of the Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 487 for Wednesday, December 4th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. The podcast is available on all of the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. Please consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. Joining me this week, Stephen ESC is back again to talk about Arcane Season 2, The Wrap Up. Welcome in, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Feels only appropriate that we, uh, <laughs> we join up again to finish this off. I agree. And I know that you are on a couple different social media platforms now. You're still Stephen ESC on Twitter, but I know that you're on, is it Mastodon and Blue Sky, or is it just Mastodon that you're spending a lot of time on right now? Uh, both. I play around on both right now. So right now I think with Blue Sky, it's only Blue Sky Social, the, the main one that is available. So I'm on there as Stephen ESC there. And then um, Stephen ESC at the Canadian Mastodon, MST and uh, .ca. I'm not on Mastodon. I just, I moved over to Blue Sky. I shouldn't say I moved over to Blue Sky. I added Blue Sky to my repertoire of stuff I have to post to now <laughs> uh, because of the number of people that are on it over the last few weeks. And um, it's all the same. My, it's my, my handle is always Joel Duggan, wherever I can find it. I'm posting on TikTok now. I do um, oh, yeah, I saw that. clips from Twitch. It's just a, a, a potential to maybe grab a new viewer and see if I can bring them over. It's not something that I'm particularly focused on because I don't always have a clip from every stream. Um, I've Mm -hmm. been using these text to speech stickers though. It's a extension on Twitch that allows people to use bits and and then um, have a sticker come up and it's like whatever they typed in, in their box would come up and say something. And so some people in the community have been having some fun with like Claptrap or Optimus Prime or Stormtrooper stickers and just kind of making some jokes uh on stream and sometimes it's very very clever and so that gets a good chuckle out of me oh, nice. and so then i uh i go in and clip that and and we'll keep it on youtube shorts and tiktok and you can post directly from twitch now like you can do you can edit your clip and then share it to either one of those platforms directly from within twitch it's not a perfect system i find sometimes it clips off the front of the clip which is real pain when you're trying to communicate context but other than that, it's it's been pretty handy. I don't have to download the video, edit it on my own, and then like upload it manually, which would take a lot of time. Yeah, it's a lot easier to do it with the tool that that Twitch provides. It's been cool. I've had a couple of people um, chime in on um, on TikTok. I get way more traction on YouTube Shorts though. TikTok might have a couple hundred views, but YouTube Shorts will have like fourteen hundred or something. You know, just oh really? Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. I th- I think that. YouTube is better at getting people what they want. So if somebody is looking for satisfactory clips or Minecraft clips, I think they're better at getting that viewer what they want. Whereas TikTok, mm. I feel, just kind of serves you whatever it thinks you want. I feel very targeted on on TikTok. I feel like they send me a lot of Canadian politics and then a lot of stuff that makes me feel like, oh, TikTok knows that I'm a 45-year-old male. Like just, it's very yeah. obvious. <laughs> Um, and I skip over that stuff as fast as I can, but it's just like, come on. Like, I mean, I haven't engaged with any of that content for a very long time. So like, why, why would you constantly try to steer that? I feel like that's the thing. YouTube will show you more of what you just watched. TikTok will do that, but then also try to steer you in a direction and I can feel the steer and I don't like it. I I tend to to try to steer the other way. So what have you been up to the last of the while? What's new in the in the geeky closet? <laughs> every once in a while I come on here, it's like new and Steve's app hunter list. It's like every once in a while, one of the apps I'm using goes away or they're, I get tired of using it. So I always try to find a new one. And, and this week is no different. I used to use an app on my phone called Stockard. I'm not sure if you heard of it. it was like, or maybe pronounced something different, but it essentially allows you to have all of your, your loyalty cards on your phone digitally. Oh, cool. Um, it it basically allows you to add cards to your phone that have a dedicated app already on the phone, like President's Choice or Optimum Points. You can't just add the card directly to it. You have to have 
the president's choice app to add it but it has to have the dedicated app on the phone and oh, then you I can see. choose to add it to the wallet through the app right but there's um yeah there's a, there's a couple of apps that i've been testing and i've sort of landed on one called barcodes because it's it's not free which is a bit of a drag so it's you have to pay for it but it's a uh, it has a feature that i haven't seen on any of them where you can add all of your cards first of all you can import all of your cards via like photos you can just like take photos of the barcodes of all of your cards you have in your wallet and then import all of those and it'll pull the numbers right off them and then you can add all of these to your wallet so it actually kind of removes the step of having to go into the phone open the app look for the one and then and then bring it up you can just double click on the side and they're there with all of your other stuff so it's uh it's pretty good i was kind of disappointed when stalker went away it was actually get absorbed into another app that was just required login information and it was more of a prompting you to go shop online app and i just no time for that so yeah the one called barcodes is actually pretty cool it's what i love to do i like to go and like look for new apps and play around with them for the few loyalty cards that i have um i just have the apps on my phone yeah uh scene card optimum card starbucks card lego insiders card ikea that's it so i've got one two three four five <laughs> so not maybe not the right contender for barcodes <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. But I've got the, uh, like, all, all of our family uh, library cards are in there. Oh, right. That's cool. There, there's a couple of other ones in there that I don't, that don't have apps on my phone that I, I haven't fully added them yet, but just in the process of converting over to it. And so, yeah, to be able to have any of them there without requiring app is pretty cool. So for me this week, I've been spending a lot of time in Satisfactory. Mm -hmm. This is the annual Satisfactory Fixmas event. Uh, I have skipped it previous years i think i checked it out the first time i did it but it wasn't overly fleshed out at the time okay but because satisfactory has hit 1.0 this fall they said that they oh, were right. going to wait until december to do an update and the update would include um the fixmas uh seasonal event with a little bit more time and thought and energy put into it and basically it's the same sort of activities that you do in satisfactory but you're making candy canes and bows and Christmas decorations and tree boughs and that kind of thing. And presents fall from the sky. You can also make gift giving trees that then produce tr uh, gifts at like 15 gifts per minute, that kind of thing. And everything has different ratios. So like it takes like two gifts to make a red ball. It takes one gift to make a blue ball. It takes three gifts to make a candy cane, like this kind of stuff. Mm. And then you have to combine that other stuff down the line to make either decorations around your base. You can make candy canes that look like telephone poles. You can make snowmen and you can make uh, Christmas trees and wreaths and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't unlocked everything because everything is put behind an advent calendar. So what I like about it is that <laughs> you don't log in and this you can just you couldn't just go through and, and knock out all of the Fixma stuff in the first week. Right. So right. everything is done with the ma'am which is the what's it called the mobile i can't remember exactly how it's what it is but it's essentially like this kiosk that you do all your research in and uh you have to get hard drives or data pads from the advent calendar and so i did the first three days worth of stuff and then the next advent calendar that had a data disk was like the fourth and then the next one is the eighth so I can't really hmm. do anything more with Fixmas until the 8th. So it's kind of cool that you can't just blow through it all. You have to kind of wait for things to to be unlocked. And so that's been that's been fun to kind of mess with. And it's just a temporary thing. I'm not making it look nice or fancy. I'm just kind of putting it in the corner of my existing factory and just kind of like exploring to see what it is. Some of the fun is that Ada, the uh, administrative digital assistant that you have, dislikes fix miss because it's a distraction like you're not being productive oh, you're yeah, basically yeah. just goofing off and so every time you pick up a present or every time you do a milestone in the ma'am ada has like a snarky reply and one of them about the snowman was really funny it's like now that you've unlocked candy canes and actual snow and actual snow is capitalized like it's not actually snow it's like a chemical compound or something but it's it's <laughs> trademark actual snow um and and she said that uh once you acquire actual snow you can build snowman which are approximately you know this the replacement for um employees friends uh and uh but don't make too many 
because that's that's ended badly before and there's like no explanation as to how badly it ended like so so here's your fake friends don't make too many like it's just, it was just such, yeah. a, such a strange underhanded comment and and they're all throughout um the only complaint that i have about the the audio is that when you're picking up presents around the world there's only maybe five different lines that that ada says and mm. it gets repetitive uh, it doesn't happen yeah. every time you pick up a gift, but like every other time. But because you're picking up like dozens, you're just like, yes, I get it. The baby could have seen this. Yeah, it's because it's a giant red sparkly present falling from the sky <laughs> with a parachute. Like it just, I see it. Like I, I understand. And so, um, so that was, that was um, my afternoon. I, I spent the first hour of stream today, I think working on that. The rest of the time, I'm just working on the Devastator factory and kind of building that out. And so what I like about it is that it doesn't take over your existing projects. Like you log in, you're excited to do some Fixma stuff. You get that done in about an hour and then you can go on and you can do something else. And so it's kind of fun right. to just have something new and it's uh, nice to do something Christmassy. And there's all very bright colors, you know, like primaries and reds and blues and greens and then there's um gold and silver i think are the next two christmas decoration uh christmas balls that i'm going to be unlocking so like that kind of stuff is fun if i really wanted to spend the time and i didn't have like a themed world going on i would like make a dedicated fixmas factory you know that because you could probably in theory return to it next year right and continue to do right. the same thing uh and what i like about the game too is that they um, they allow you to um, disable it. So if you don't want to participate, you just go into the settings and say like disable seasonal events, done. And it just, the fix this stuff just doesn't show up. Engage bah humbug. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in, in terms of your, your unsatisfactory world, I don't, I've never played it and I've seen you play it, but I haven't really gone looking for others who play it. Do you, do you find that themed worlds is fairly common or... Or like, is your approach pretty unique in the sense that most people just build stuff in order to actually, I, I know the pun is intended, but to get satisfaction out of just building the factories for building factory sake, or do you? The majority of players play it with like goal oriented. So they just, they just log in to make the stuff and they make the stuff okay. and they, and they're not terribly worried about it being pretty. They might want it to be organized because if you're not organized, it becomes really difficult to try to figure out like, where did that go? Like why? Like when you get belt spaghetti happening, it becomes very difficult to track what's going on. <laughs> so if you're building neat and orderly, it does make the game easier for you. It's just a little bit more time consuming up front. Right. Um, the people that I follow tend to be people like Total Eclipse, It's Bits, uh, I'm Kibitz. They're all people that, while they don't have a theme necessarily, they have a vision for what they want to do with the playthrough. Um, right. Total Eclipse is doing a lot of white and orange. So all of his factories kind of look like they were made by like, we'll say like the same company or the same architect. They all have the same sort of like visual style, but he's not theming it after anything. It's not like it's the Super Mario world or anything like that. Like I've right. decided to go with Transformers just for something fun and, and big in machinery. And that's kind of like how I grew up when I think about this kind of world. I kind of think about like Transformers and so that's unique for me. It's not always a hit out of the park too. Like I'm still having to like dumb down the designs a bit. They look sometimes less oh, like course. transformers and more like factories because they kind of have to in, in some regards, but it's fun for me and it keeps it pretty lively. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I combined the two worlds. So like I was build, doing a 1.0 world with like Autobot designs. And then I've got my three-year-old okay. world that has like the Devastator build in it. So I used an online tool to combine the two together. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. So now like the 10 weeks of work that I did this fall is now included in the file that has the three-year-old builds on it. Ah, uh, sweet. Cause I got to the point in that 10 week build where like I was at the same tech level and the next step was like the really sticky stuff, like the, the aluminum production or like the, the, the big power plant and they are huge endeavors. And I was like, I don't want to do this again. I just did this in the last year on this other playthrough. So it felt like kind of like a, a repetition of both my time and content. So I decided right. to combine them and right away that gives me all kinds of advantages and um, it takes care of some baseline production and some storage. And so all the things I did this fall are actually kind of like a really good thing for the file going forward. And so uh, that's what I, where I am now with it. I'm, I'm just working on a factory that's just so large that even though I spent like three hours a day working on it, I really don't feel like I made a lot of headway because uh, a lot of it is kind of designing by the suit of your pants in the same way that I play Minecraft. Like I don't plan Minecraft ahead of time. I log in 
and I design live on stream. That's kind of my MO. Right. And I do the same thing with satisfactory. I have some reference pictures, but like I'm kind of spitballing this as I go. And if it doesn't work, the good thing about satisfactory is if you're undoing something and redoing it, it doesn't take that long. If when you're talking about like aesthetics, building walls and ceilings and, and different features of how a factory looks super easy to do. You can build like 10 things at a time. You can delete 50 things at a time. Like it's very, very easy. The stuff that's really time consuming and satisfactory to redo is like a factory production floor with like machines and belts and numbers right. and balances. Like that's something you want to kind of plan and get right the first time. But the decoration and stuff, that's kind of like fly by the seat of my pants. The other thing that's technical for me is uh, physical in the real world. I took advantage of the Black Friday sales and picked up the Mount Dog LED softbox light kit. And this is uh, new to me. I've not kind of done this ever uh, because I'm new to video for the spawn chunks and also on Twitch. I'm doing a face cam now on Twitch and I have uh, softboxes. And so these are big studio lights that will be dimmable. They have a light temperature control, warm to cool. And they're also LEDs, so they will not get hot in my small studio, That's which is nice. good because as uh, mm -hmm. the summer comes and I'm still using these lights and video, it's going to be going to be sweaty in here if I uh, if I can't control um, the the lights, especially if I upgrade computers in the new year and you've got like more heat coming off of those and all that kind of stuff. I've not set them up; they only just arrived today, like moments before I started streaming, so I've not really messed around with them at all. They are very entry level. Uh, I'm sure that there are better products out there, but I have a very small space. And I didn't want to go with LED panels, which save you a lot of space, obviously, because they're flat, but they're also very harsh. And I wanted a little bit more control. And so with mm. these, I can, um, even if I can't find a place for the tripods, I can probably fasten them to my shelves. I, you, it's been a while since you've been here, but I've got um, some large shelves in my studio that have like Lego boxes and stuff on them. And these soft boxes are pretty light. I feel like I could mount them to the underside of the shelves uh, if I found a place that was a good permanent spot for them. So I'll, uh, I'll update people as that, that goes. Um, I do have some space throughout the, the middle of the room that I could probably use. It's just a matter of, um, also cleaning up the corners. There's a couple of places that have like a lot of boxes piled up that if I needed to put a light there, I totally could. I just need to, right. to figure out how to, to best do that. I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos about lighting and lighting YouTube videos. And even though I'm not doing like talking head YouTube, I'm doing more podcast stuff and streaming. The same principles kind of apply in terms of lighting video. And I'm getting a flashback from when I was in animation school because I took a film class when I was there. Uh, it was mostly aimed at like storyboarding and directing animation. So you still have to know about lighting and key lights and lighting the subject and stuff, but it was all meant to be like manufactured, like you're faking it in a drawing, but you still have to know the principles of it. Right. With this, like I just, obviously it's more practical. So I'm just kind of researching some stuff on YouTube and man, there is an endless supply of videos. And we were talking earlier <laughs> about social media, kind of like giving you what you want. You watch one or two videos about how to make or how to light a YouTube video. And YouTube will just give you dozens and dozens of people uh, that are all uh, probably essentially telling you the same thing. I've not really, I've watched four or five videos and I've only had a couple of people that have given me new information. But uh, it's been a fun learning curve and uh, it took me a while to kind of decide what lights to get. And there were some other recommendations, but even the, the entry level, we'll say entry level beyond what these are, it's like 300 bucks for one light. I was like, if I was doing like YouTube videos and talking head videos, like opinion videos, and, and that was my job and, I was, and it was doing really well, I'd totally invest in, in those kind of lights. But for this, in this space where it's an apartment, it's a temporary space, like it's not mine, I don't own it. I can't like do permanent changes to it. I thought that the cheaper ones would be at least where to start. And um, if, yeah. if, I, if they don't work out, well, one, I can return them. And, I, and the nice thing about now when you're buying stuff on Amazon is that so many people are buying gifts that like the return policy is like 90 days or something. So yeah. it's well into the new year. So um, if they don't work out or I don't have the right space for them or whatever, then I can always return them. But we'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't know if I'll get there tomorrow, but I'll probably get there before next week. So I'd like to set it up for the Spawn Chunks video on Monday. Moving into the main discussion, we're going to talk about Arcane Season 2, Acts 2 and 3, Episodes 4 through 6 and Episodes 7 through 9, respectively. Spoiler 
warning there is no way yeah. to talk about this <laughs> show uh and all the things that happen in the second half of season two without spoiling it it's also been a couple of weeks since the uh show has wrapped up uh it wrapped up on the american thanksgiving weekend or the weekend before maybe and so it's been a little while so i feel like anybody that's been really champing at the bit to watch the show has probably done so already um yeah. i'm starting to see the reaction videos of people watching the final episode show up on youtube uh, in the last couple of days, just because it's probably been like they wanted to get past the spoiler zone. They also probably needed the time to edit the videos and post them and share them and stuff. So now that we're starting to see that, I thought it would be a good time to to talk about Arcane. And uh, I'm curious because you and I, uh, in the last episode of the Citadel Cafe, were talking about where we thought things were going uh, after the first three episodes of season two. And I forgot that in season one, after the first three episodes, that there was a big time jump. And right. I didn't think they were going to do that again. And they did. I don't think it was quite as big of a time jump, but it was still a time jump. And so when I started getting into episodes four through six, I was like, oh, wow, I really don't know where this is going uh, because they're going to have to bring us up to speed, which they did in like a, a cool montage at the beginning of, of episode four. So what, like w when you started, like, what were your thoughts in terms of like, Ooh, I was right. Or, Ooh, I don't know where this is going. Uh, it was definitely more in the, uh, the side of, I had no idea where it was going. It was, uh, and, and I think we'll get into it a little bit later, but it, it sort of went from being what I thought the more focused story was to like through the net wide open in terms of like things that it introduced. So I was, I was caught off guard by it. A number of things i was still i still loved the show but it yeah it definitely took me for a ride i, had, <laughs> I wasn't sure what to expect yeah i still recommend the show like i still think that the show oh, yeah. is beautifully animated well written and the world of rune terra is pretty unique and rich overall i i think that there's a lot of stuff in here for fans of just about any genre whether you like sci-fi fantasy steampunk um victorian stuff like like any kind of like genre fiction that you might be into i feel like there's going to be something for you there's magic there's technology there's witchcraft there's you know sorcery there's fancy lights and lasers like there's all kinds of stuff just for you know anyone um yeah. i did really enjoy specifically in season two the different animation we mentioned it briefly in i think mm -hmm. it was um vi's mother's funeral no, not not vi um caitlin's mother's funeral and it was like a charcoal drawing that I think really spoke yeah. to you. They do that kind of thing. It's not just a charcoal drawing. They do very specific, either painted scenes, slow animation, like two or four frames a second, as opposed to 30 frames a second, uh, different art styles. They have slides, they have storyboards, they have all these different ways of telling a story folded mm -hmm. into season two. And they do it a lot more than they did in season one, but they don't do it willy nilly. Every time they're no. doing it, it's uh, either catching you up quick by showing you basically like posters or storyboards of the events that have happened over the last few years, or they're using it to change a character's perspective, give you the view of somebody else or something else, or they're really slowing down what is really a very fast paced show. And, and they're making you feel something like they're saying, okay, this is the emotion of this scene combined with the music and the, and the, and the sto not stop motion, but like the very framey animation, it's going to grab your attention and it's going to slow your mm -hmm. brain down to the point where you can absorb the emotion they're trying to convey. It's very well done. Yeah. It's very artfully uh, and s done and very selective, I think, in terms of where they do it. Overall it could very well be the most stunning show I've ever seen. I was, I was trying to think of any other show that was that consistently beautiful, visually beautiful from beginning to end. Like you can pause almost any frame in the entire show and it's perfect. I think the closest thing of memory, and I'm thinking of animation specifically, probably just because Arcane is animated, but uh, Blue-Eyed Samurai was also a very pretty show. That's true. And it has a sim similar feel to it visually, like the um, the Spider Verse movies with Miles Morales. Oh yeah, is very very similar as well. So it's and for, for me, it's just that it was just at this level that I don't think that I've seen matched anywhere else, for personally anyway. Yeah, 
Well, I think too that the Spider Verse they're films too, right? So like it's different mm-hmm. to do that for two hours compared to God, how many hours is Arcane? Like eighteen or twenty two or something like that. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, like each episode is almost an hour or close to it. Yeah. So like nine, yeah. So this first, so two seasons, yeah, it's probably roughly eighteen hours, give or take. I'm not sure what the full runtime is, but it's it's close to that. And to keep that up consistently over that long. Well, the budget for this series, season one and two, was $250 million. Imagine. Holy smokes. Wild. I'm pretty sure that it is the most expensive animated series ever made, (laughs) which is why they're not making season three. Um, Yeah, no kidding. There are other stories they want to tell. They've not said what medium those stories are going to be told in. I maintain that Arcane was a really good litmus test for whether or not the Riot MMO that's in development will land well. And I think it will. If they've got the same kind of writer team on the Riot MMO that they do Arcane, then I think mm. it's it's pretty clear that the world, or certainly the people that are interested in these kind of stories, would be 100% on board to witness and experience the stories like that in an MMO. And that's good because MMOs are very expensive to make. And, and if your audience is not ready for them or willing to spend the time in them, then they flop and they don't end up being as good as they could be um, because they're the kind of game that like requires both parties. It's not that a game studio can just make a game and put it out there and hope that people play it. And maybe it gets picked up later. MMOs are like organic in that way. Like they need the player base to keep them going. Right. And so I'm hoping that that's one of the places that they're going to tell the story. I'd imagine they're just going to tell different stories around Runeterra with different characters in different parts of the world. I would imagine they'll probably stick with animation, but it might not be quite so expensive. Like it might not be quite this level. We might see like an anime. Maybe we'll see anthologies like the Star Wars Visions. I don't think they would do live action because I think that live action would just be more expensive. And because of the world of Runeterra, I, I don't think live action, you'd have to animate most of the stuff anyway, right? Like half yeah. of the stuff doesn't exist. So you'd have to do special effects and animation. So you might as well just do the whole thing in animation as far as I'm concerned. I think you'd lose a lot of the characteristics of the characters as well. Because I mean, like, yeah, Haley Steinfeld is an equ- excellent actor and really enjoy your voice acting work. But there's like you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who fits the look of Vi. Mm-hmm. can and can convincingly act the role as well like her, her character design is so cool and so badass but sometimes i find live action just not cheapens but it just it can't do it justice so i'm, I'm hoping that it's not a live action yeah when you have stuff that's as, as, as exaggerated as comic characters you know like mm-hmm. you have i guess the best example is marvel doing it very very well i mean some of that is casting some of that is costuming and some of that is the characters that they chose are pretty down to earth in terms of how they look, right? Like they're like Thor, as wildly powerful as he is, is physically a man. Like he's he's not, right. you know, different than the Hulk. Like he's not a monster. He's not. It's akin to like why Venom as a character is such a unique thing. If you do, you don't want to have seven of those in the same movie because it just becomes at that point again it just becomes an animated show, right? Mm-hmm. I did find in the second season that the music did not always hit for me in the way that the first oh, season really? did. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying, I don't think overall it was bad. I think overall still good. I think there was just one or two sections where call it not my kind of music or something I didn't feel fit very well. Um, right. Only happened once or twice. I don't remember the songs or the moments. Like I don't remember specifics, but I do kind of remember going like, eh, this is not really working for me. Um, there are other times when it 100% did. So like, it's not, it's not like it missed all the time. I just, there was a couple of like near misses. I'm just like, well, okay, that's, that wasn't the best. But again, I think I'll chalk it up to personal taste over like, you know, feeling it was some sort of artistic failure. I just like, well, that's not really for me. Yeah. I feel like I need to go back and watch season two again. Cause we, we've probably seen season one four times now as a family. And like, you've got that song on the end by Sting. Mm-hmm. which really suits the final scene of season one. Then there was also that, the, I don't know what kind of genre, it's kind of this kind of gritty hip hop but not quite hip-hop song that was playing during the battle between 
Jinx and Echo at the end of season one as well. That was just really quite solid. So hearing you talk about the music, it's making me wonder that there's nothing really from season two that I enjoyed it, but there's no standout songs to me. Like season one had those two that really stick in my mind, but I'll have to go back and watch it again. The only one that sticks in my mind from season two was when Echo and Powder were dancing in the oh. alternate universe, the French song. Right. That was the yeah. only one that kind of really stood stood out to me. But yeah. like, I, I, I'm not an audiophile. Like I, do, I don't keep up in a lot of stuff. So like, I, I don't, like, I'm not the right person to necessarily judge all the music. I just, I'm the person who's mm. like, well, I can just tell you what worked and didn't work. I have one major complaint about season two. And we'll get into the specifics and stuff later. But I found the ending really convoluted. I feel like it roamed outside of what I felt the genre of the show was. And even yeah. Acts 1 and 2 were still pretty good. But Acts 3, I, I felt like it just went off the rails. And I'm just like, what, like, what am I watching? It was so heady. And I don't think it needed to be. Like so much of the show, especially focusing on Jinx and Vi, who blow stuff up and punch stuff. Like it was, yeah, yeah. it's a very physical, like punch your problems in the face until they go away. And I feel like the whole Victor, whatever he turns into and the realm that he's in and the, his abilities just got way outside of what I thought the show was. And I don't even want to put it on Victor's shoulders. I think it's the anomaly the whole weird gooey thing that kind of like pulls Jace, Echo, and Heimerdinger into, Heimerdinger. into the different dimensions. Mm -hmm. like, th like that to me was just like, that's just weird. And I don't necessarily think it fit with the rest of the weird. Like I know, I know Arcane's a weird show in places. There's some really strange characters and stuff, but I just, I really felt like that was, outside of the rules that the show had set up in season one mm -hmm. and most of season two. I feel like that was the thing. Like we didn't get any kind of precursor as to what this was. It, and visually it was so different than anything. And we didn't really get much of an explanation. And the, and I mean, part yeah. of that is because the characters don't know what it is either. And except for Victor, but then Victor never articulates what it is. So like you don't, he's like, Oh, this is so interesting. And, what an amazing thing. It's like, yeah, great, Victor. Tell me what it is, please, because <laughs> no one else has. And so, yeah, I just, I wasn't a big fan of, of the act three really into, well, I shouldn't say that. I wasn't a big fan of that particular arc in act three, the, the yeah. Victor main story climax things we have to deal with arc, uh, the character development in act three, like following Jinx and Vi, following Caitlin and Vi, following um, Mel and her mom. Like all of that was still solid, totally solid all the way through the show. Uh, but it was just like this, the, the reason why they are where they are was just like, hey, what? What's going on? Why is this thing weird? Like it just, it was so strange. I, I, I agree fully with that. It went like from season one to most of season two, like you said, it went from being between Piltover and, and Zahn and the conflict between the two cities for essentially the entirety of se season one and a chunk of season two to like throw in the uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness right into the middle of it sort of thing. Is yeah, it? totally. And you know, there, there was a lot of it that I liked and, it, and I thought like even though it was heady that it was visually very cool how they kind of showed the different colors and spatial textures on people's like highlights and shadows and things like that. I thought it was very cool, but it left, it did leave me confused as well. I, and I felt it was, it felt like this, suddenly this weird, weird backdrop to them still trying to wrap up the Piltover and Zahn story. Like I, every time that I watch something and it's going really well, I always go, oh man, I hope they stick the landing. I hope they stick the landing. And like, um, my favorite ending of all time for a show is still Avatar The Last Airbender. It was, you know, it, it had filler episodes, which fell flat and wasn't super strong. 100% strong all the way through, but it was a story that had a clear, like basically narrative arc laid out from the beginning where there's this threat, this is the schedule of the threat, we need to deal with the threat. And they dealt with it in a way that, like, Aang had so many people advising him on, him on what to do, but then he still found his own way to do it. And it was like the perfect ending to that tale. 
it just it didn't need to go into a different world it didn't need to add 50 different layers of complexity it was just i wish more shows did that instead of going well now we need to try to get extra super duper interesting just to make people happy with the ending like they could have kept no alternate timeline oh you know i say that but there's a couple of alternate timeline scenes that were just top notch from this from this season but i just i feel like they still could have found a way to just weave it all into the piltover uh, zon storyline yeah i don't know why they had to go into alternate universes and why jace ends up in a futuristic hellscape universe and mm -hmm. heimerdinger and echo end up in the same alternate universe even though heimerdinger arrives like three years ahead of jace it's still like yeah. but how but how how are you in the same one uh, and that's where i just I feel like when you get into like alternate universes and time travel, that's where that half the time in other shows, the script would just be like, because, because reasons, and you just have to <laughs> accept it. And this show doesn't necessarily do that. They give you a reason emotionally to be there, but they don't really explain anything else. And it, to me, I think that the strength of the alternate universe for Echo specifically was the relationship we got to see with Powder and Echo. Mm. And you get to see what Powder would be like if she wasn't broken. And there's still yeah. tragedy. Like uh, in that universe, Vi dies in the explosion in the, like that happens in the first episode of the series that, um, that gets them all in trouble. And because of that, I, I don't remember what happened whether maybe Powder didn't go with her. Or what, like, I'm not, they don't explain what happened differently, at least not well, uh, that I remember as to why di Vi died. She died, and then you get to see Powder without her. But because Vi died, Vi doesn't snap on Powder. Vi doesn't um, break her and betray, not right. betray her, but like really hurt her and leave her for Silco. And because of that, you know, Vander's alive, the other two characters that Silco's alive and not evil. And, yeah. um, who are the, the two, the two boys that died in the explosion in season one that, that, oh, um, and Milo Milo. Yeah. They're alive and you get to see what powder was really like as an adult. And one, I think advantage to that from a story perspective or an emotional perspective is like the people watching want that. And you mm -hmm. are never going to get it in the prime universe. Like that's not something that they had the time to necessarily tell you because even though you get some somber moments and some nice relationship stuff with Vi and Jinx in the prime universe, Jinx is still broken and Jinx still yeah. has to, has done some stuff and can't just disappear from the stuff that she's done. And there's other things at play there. And so you're never going to get a powder without jinx it's too late like you can't go back that far i think what you might get in the prime universe would be whatever happens after jinx it's not powder and it's right. not jinx it's something else but you're never going to actually see like a happy powder and so you got that and you got this cool thing with echo and powder like there's a kiss and it's super cool and romantic and it's like everybody's like squee this is what i wanted to see and it all gets <laughs> ripped away um and you don't know what happens and and the thing like I find so bizarre is like they, they just, they leave that completely wide open and, and then they go back to the prime universe. And so I, I don't know what they were necessarily trying to do because you can outside of echo learning how to time travel while trying to get home from the other universe, nothing else matters. Like nothing else that happens there has any consequence in the prime universe outside of like echoes, maybe feelings for jinx, but they're always there. Like they, they were always there. It's not like they were new. Um, I, I was, I felt that like it was sort of a launching for him to go seek her out because if, if they didn't have that moment, then jinx, well, jinx would have been dead in the current timeline because she, yeah, she killed herself, but he, he basically then sought her out because of the relationship they had and the feelings they had in the alternate world so that the two of them could go and work towards saving the day. 
But this is where I find that you're talking about random universes that this thing sends you to, but then you're also talking about, well, this is all fated to happen and it happens in a time loop. And this goes to the whole Victor thing at the end where it just, mm. it's, it goes into time travel. And I'm just like, but just you've created a couple of loops and you don't really explain them well enough for me. Yeah. I, I didn't find that sat very well for me again. Like I, I will forgive the, strangeness of the alt universe stuff because of how wonderful and emotionally powerful it was to have those moments like watching powder enter the party and having mm -hmm. them have that like dance sequence where they're dancing to an upbeat but fairly romantic i think french lyric song yeah it's called my ma my ma enemy so basically my instead of my best friend it was my best enemy play on words it's in like a four frames a second or two frames a second. Like it's really pose to pose animation and it's beautifully mm -hmm. done. And again, it slows you right down as it should. Yeah. And that is the payoff of like going to that universe. There's the, it's the emotional stuff. You have to kind of like say, okay, well this was for my emotional storytelling side, not necessarily the logic brain. And cause you have to kind of set that aside, which in again, like considering all the weird shit that happens in this show, you kind of have to, put logic kind of like on a sort of a back burner it's true other people online are far better at pulling apart teeny tiny pieces of this show and other shows than i am so there's there's one part where they showed echo on one side of the screen and, and powder on the other when they were building the time machine and echo was creating the ruins and then snapping them into the side of the machine and then it shows uh powder on the other side doing exactly the same thing but basically the, the way that they shot it, it looked like they were working on the same thing at the same time. But then at a closer look, it actually looks like they're, it's not the same time. So there's a good, like, even though it's not explicitly written, there's a good chance that Echo was creating that one in the current timeline. And then the scene with on the other side of the, the screen with Powder is actually showing her build her own time machine in the future. Because at the end of that scene, they show that she had all of those, all of the hex stones. Mm, in a pouch mm. still so even even though the timeline in the timeline hex tech never existed she still had all the gems available like, available to her and after seeing what echo and heimerdinger did it sort of alluded to the fact that she's now going to take that timeline forward in that direction sort of thing so it's i don't know so, so many things that are interesting that i just didn't catch the first time through i hope they don't get into like full-on stories and alt timelines like i don't want to get into that mess that happens in it's my least favorite part of Marvel is like the whole time slipping thing, like the whole multiple timelines and prime timelines and like essentially Deadpool and Wolverine. Like it just, it was a fun movie, but oh. the whole timeline thing drives me crazy because it just becomes like infinite possibilities and infinite universes. And I just, it's such a headache to try and tell a good straightforward story in that spaghetti. Yeah. Um, so I hope that they don't do like, well, here's a great alt story in the League of Legends alt timeline, which ultimately doesn't matter because you don't, this isn't like canon or something. I was like, I just, at that point, it's like, yeah, it's cool. But like, I, why am I watching it if it's not in, if I'm already invested in this world and these characters, like, why are you giving me something that ultimately doesn't matter? So right. I, I do find it tricky in that, in that way. I did like that they showed the, the, our echo to powder with her echo on the ground. So that she knew she got an answer to like the questions she obviously had about what the hell's going on and, and seeing two of them, I think would kind of solidify that to her. Cause she's obviously pretty smart. And, mm -hmm. and I think that was, that was cool in that they, you didn't leave that universe thinking like, oh God, that's, we just saw happy powder and then something happened that's going to break her. Right. But that's not the case. I feel like she has enough, enough information to like not be overwhelmed and and broken by by the situation one of the things that i found odd and it's just basically they had the new echo there no clue about anything that's going on and barely anyone caught on to the fact that something was off they just like oh no you get the nerves about the big big competition coming up but he, he's like he's just saying stuff that <laughs> any sane version of me if i started going like what didn't you try to kill so-and-so like that would have been years and years and years ago. And he would have known that, but everyone just like, Oh yeah, you know, things change. And that would have, that would have been something that you really call somebody a person out on. So 
that's one of those things that I felt they glossed over a little bit too easily. They're, they're pretty good about a lot of the details in this, but that was just like, a, I found that to be a bit of a weird one. My favorite thing about, like you mentioned it, but the fact that the time jump thing, the four second rewind ability, that was a pretty cool thing that he was able to bring back into the current time. Like I, I don't play the video game, so I didn't actually know that that was a part of his character. Um, but I thought what they actually ended up doing with that four second rewind ability was pretty like, through, throughout the remainder of the movie or the show, regardless of how you think it went, it actually was pretty slick. And I'm not sure if you, you saw any videos online about it, but that at the end of season one and the fight between Echo and Jinx, they sort of allude to his four second rewind ability there because they sort of showed there was a mixture of them as older and them as animated as little kids sort of mm -hmm. fighting each other. And so the the little battle where the two of them fought as kids, it was like a slow motion sort of choppy attack by Echo on Jinx or Powder at that point. And then she shoots him and hits him in the chest and then it rewinds. And someone did a like a frame by frame analysis. So like it rewinds and then he does the same attack, but then jumps off the other foot at the very end because he's like, quote unquote, learned the first time. And that entire sequence was exactly four seconds. So it's like... It's like things that I would never have known about. Like, this is what I love about the internet where they, people who have more time on their hands than I do are able to pull this stuff apart. I mean, a lot of these people are familiar with the game too, in terms of like abilities, they know what Easter eggs to look for. And, and yeah. I, I watch, I watched like summary videos and like the ending explained and like this kind of stuff from a couple of different creators. And it does help when you've got someone that's knowledgeable from league of legends and the characters and that kind of stuff to be like, Oh, well, this is uh, an Easter egg for this character. And, you know, um, th there's a there's a three eyed raven that you see at some point, and that's apparently kind of like an icon of another League of Legends character from Noxus, like one of the three governing rulers of Noxus. Um, oh, yeah. And and I can't remember he's some sort of general. I don't remember his name, but like that's the kind of thing where like you know the crow is important. It's got three eyes. It's very weird, and it's always around yeah. Noxians. But like you don't really know the significance of it unless you're a Lord of a uh, 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 League of Legends player. So. Yeah, like I just, I can, I, I like picking up on that kind of stuff from people, like you said, that have either enough time or enough existing knowledge that they're going to pick up on that kind of stuff when they, when they watch the show. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked the different things they did with Mel as well. I wasn't sure where that was going to go. I think at the end of act one, she was basically like overwhelmed by this like black rose magic thing. And I right. just thought, you know, as per what we've been led to believe that the Black Rose kidnapped her brother and now it's after her because of some shit that her mother did. And it's all just kind of like catching up to Mel, even though we like Mel and we don't want to have anything bad happen to her. But it's a twist I didn't expect. They manipulate her and they show her her dead brother. And this is the thing that's very difficult in animation, I find, is that she's obviously, after it's been revealed, in some sort of like dream sequence. She's being mind controlled by a mage. But while you're watching it, because it's all animation, you like, and it's all fantasy animation, like you're not sure what's real and what's not. And right. so it was kind of uh, an interesting way to do it. But eventually they kind of pull her mage powers out of her. They get her to react. And I thought that was really cool in that the Black Rose wasn't trying to kidnap her to get back at her mother. The Black Rose was trying to unlock her powers so she could deal with her mother. And I thought that was a cool twist. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting some sort of like Black Rose telling her like the truth about her mother or something like some truth would be revealed, but I wasn't expecting it to necessarily be like, you are the weapon hmm. that your mother has been looking for, even though she doesn't realize it. Like it just, it was such yeah. a, such an interesting twist. And to know that what, um, her mother has always been pushing for is like for her to become the wolf and grow a pair of teeth essentially instead of like being a diplomat she eventually does and it leads to her mother's undoing like it leads to right. you know the fight between caitlin and mel and, and her mom i'm trying to remember her mom's name right now it'll be on the tip of my tongue ambessa uh, ambessa right um i continue to dislike ambessa immensely i don't dislike the <laughs> character in terms of like it was very well done but well, so well done to the point where you, you just despise her. Like you just, you are so 
ready for her to lose when she loses. Like, it's just, she's such a good character and makes you so angry. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a really rewarding arc for her to be the antagonist for all of season two and to get her kind of comeuppance at the end, um, from Mel. And I like, I like the fact that it takes two of them to beat her because granted Mel probably could on her own. I don't think emotionally she could on her own. So you kind of need the anger from Caitlin and then the physical power of Mel and magical power of Mel to overcome the cunning and physical strength of Ambessa. Yeah. She also had those, um, those ruins tied around her arm that her, her, her um, first in command used to have, which basically protected her from the magic, mm -hmm. like the magic attacks one at a time kind of thing until they ran out. So it was, uh, yeah, she was a, definitely a force to be reckoned with at that time. I liked that in that fight, Caitlin had to make a sacrifice too. Like, even though the good guys win and Ambassa dies, Caitlin lost an eye. So it reminded me of um, How to Train Your Dragon when Hiccup loses oh, a leg yeah. in the final fight. Like, he wins and we're happy that he wins, but he doesn't come out unscathed because he made a mistake hurting Hiccup in the first place, right? Yeah. Or hurting um, Toothless. I got the names mixed up. And, and Caitlin has made mistakes, even though she's gone back to the right track. She has, she made the mistakes of following Ambessa's advice and being manipulated by her. And so she doesn't get out scot-free. And I think it's really interesting that, that yeah. not a lot of characters in this get out of this scot-free. And, um, I watched a couple of different reactions and one of them that I watched was from uh natalie gold is a, a reaction youtuber and she and i had the same reaction to maddie betraying caitlin oh and man i was just like whoa whoa i was not expecting it so angry and the amount of beeps and and swears <laughs> that were edited out of Natalie Gold's reaction video. Like she was just viscerally angry at Maddie and had the same like yes! reaction that I did when the bullet ricocheted and took her out. Like snap, crackle, pop, you're dead. And it's just like, yes. <laughs> Cause yeah. man, could not believe it. I, I was beside myself, genuinely shocked that that ex execution style shot got fired off and they got fired off as quickly as it did because mm -hmm. i had that moment of like just gasp thinking caitlin was done for because there was no pause and then and then they showed the close-up of the bullet behind her and i didn't quite realize that it was protection at, like a, a shield at first so i thought it was just like the slow motion lasts you know the last split second you see before caitlin's dead and then the oh yeah the ricochet around was was brilliant I didn't have a quite the uh, the angry. It was more of a, a shock, and then we all cheered with relief when we realized what happened. It was a uh, one of the one of the more satisfying karma scenes in the entire thing. <laughs> I wasn't angry at the trigger pull. I was angry at the re the reveal that it was Maddie that had hit her in the back oh. of the head with the with the the gun stock. Right, right, right. I had the same panic reaction you did. They pulled the trigger, and I was just like, Whoa! like holding my yeah. breath. There was a lot of uh, hand wringing in this series. A lot of me sitting on the couch with my hands in my lap, kind of like rubbing together, going like, what, <laughs> what, what are you going to do with my yeah. favorite character show? <laughs> what, yeah, yeah. what are you going to do? Uh, there's a couple of close calls. Um, I don't know if I felt that Vi was ever in any, any trouble, but like Vi's got main character energy. So like, I wasn't terribly worried. And there's a couple of, I think, main characters that are heroes that I also know are main heroes in the game that I was just like, I kind of mm. feel like they have plot armor. It's more, it's not that you think they're going to die. It's more like you think like what unfortunate emotional tragedy are they going to have lived through? And you feel bad right. for them, but you don't really feel like they're going to necessarily be in peril um, because of just how good they seem to be like jinx with her um, oh, shimmer, shimmer, her shimmer powers. Like the fact that she can zip around super fast and like almost see stuff coming in slow motion and you kind of think, okay, well, she's going to, she's got some survival skills. Like I'm not too worried about her, even in a fight with Warwick, right? I, I wasn't too, too worried about it. How vindicated did you feel that Warwick ended up being Vander? 
Um, I thought it was pretty cool. It was, uh, I, I don't know that I felt vindicated, but I, I was glad that he was still alive. So, but actually that's one of my complaints about the show. I found it weird that they made a point of bringing him back to life, which I was happy about only to sort of quote unquote, kill him again to only bring him back to life as a different version of, <laughs> hmm. of, uh, uh, beast Vander to then only have him killed again at the end. It was just like, why, why do like he was, I found he was such a cool character, like such a, a genuinely caring father figure in the first season. And it was tragic that he died. And then like the whole back and forth, back and forth. Now he's, you know, he's finally dead now. I thought that was weird, but I, I, I was, I was pretty pleased that he came back to be honest. And I, and I thought the, uh, the reintroduction scenes when he realizes powder is powder. And when he realizes Vi is Vi, I thought that thought both of those scenes were amazing. And like, I've said it before on the podcast, but this TV show has, if not the best, one of the best uses of slow motion for action, emotion, anything that I've ever seen. And the scene where Vander's rushing at Vi as this big beast and the slow motion where she puts her, her fists out to the side with the big gauntlets. And then he's jumping at her from the other side. And like, basically he's, he covers her entirely. Like his silhouette jumping at her is wider than her her with her arms out kind of thing and it was just this huge slow motion moment that was brilliant and then just slams into this giant hug it's just they did those moments with the reintroduction of them so so well like i mean i guess to me it was i'm not sure that i felt super vindicated i was happy but i sort of i couldn't figure out who else it would have been like just somebody that was that sheer size that we would have cared would have come back because i think the uh, the only other person that used the shimmer and was that large was that i keep forgetting his name but that sort of kid from season one who ended up ended up dying so i had a had a feeling it was him but it was good i'm, I'm not disappointed he came back i wouldn't have minded if they gave him plot armor <laughs> at the end because i just felt like he would have earned it at that point i was disappointed when vander died in season one as well but i didn't at all pick up that it was a human in the cave i just thought it was the wolf like i guess it had big it had four legs it was strung up by the big front four legs and it i think the thing in the cave had two heads so like i it wasn't like it was a real wolf it was obviously some sort of like spirit like some sort of monster thing and so i never thought i just thought it was going to be one of the singed monsters like i didn't think it was going to necessarily be like a person oh, okay. like i did so i didn't know i i got spoiled i was digging around on the on youtube watching stuff and then somebody was saying like my money is on this and they gave a bunch of reasons like all right well that makes sense i guess because they were bringing in reasons from like other sources like the game and different lore and i was like okay well sure so like i knew before i went in that it's probably that's what it was right uh and then confirmed obviously when he said powder well i knew as soon as he started to have flashbacks when they started showing flashbacks of young powder when he was in the fight with, with jinx i was like all right well this is obviously vander i wish they had made him look a little bit more like vander so I didn't have that connection. Like I didn't, I, I know that that's what they were trying to go for, but I, I didn't know mm. how Vi would look at that and think Vander, you know, like I just, right. I, I feel like there just wasn't quite enough of Vander in the face for it to really look like him. And in the game, Warwick is like wolf head. Like he doesn't look like a man at all. He's got a man body. But like in terms of like the walks in the hind legs and got big front forearms, but like he's, it's a wolf head. It's not, it's not anything that looks like a human. In the game, do you know, is Warwick meant to be um, Vander brought back to life? I don't think Vander's in the game at all. I I, I think Vander's okay. just been made up for, for Arcane, as far as I can tell. I don't know. The, the bloodlust thing is a real thing. Like that's, um, I guess like his finishing move in the game. And so the whole bloodlust thing in the show is, is, is kind of like, just like they take like the four second ability from Echo and they turn it into this cool, like character plot arc for Echo in mm -hmm. the story, in the arcane, in, in the, in the Warwick's case, they, they make it like this thing that like awakens him or turns him into this controlled beast by singed as opposed to right. having his faculties. And, but I agree, I agree with all that you said about like, they brought him back, but then they killed him again and then they brought him back again. And like, I just, that to me was a real problem. I didn't like the victorified, uh, the, the glossy version of <laughs> Warwick at the end. Yeah. Because at that point, Vander's gone, like gone, gone, because in order to absorb him, I guess, and heal Victor, 
kills him or removes whatever consciousness is there. But the problem yeah. that I have without feeling that connection to Vander is that Vi keeps on making the same, same mistakes over and over again in terms of like, it's what gets her into trouble at the end where she's trying to save this thing that no longer has any Vander in it and, and hasn't given you any reason to believe there's any Vander in it. And yet she's still trying to save it and he's trying yeah. to kill her. And I was like, this, it does, that to me was like really, it didn't make a lot of sense. It's the kind of thing where like they give the audience the information, but then they don't give the information to the characters. And so it's just, it's very frustrating to watch because it's just like, it's, it's futile and it's putting you in danger. Like, could you just stop it? And it's just, it's not <laughs> a fun experience, but I did see one comment online. I think it might've been Natalie Gold actually saying that Vi making the same mistakes over and over again is like one of the reasons why Vi has a heart. Like it's, it's, it's mm. not, it's a character flaw. Yes. But it's like, it's, it keeps her human. She's not making the same tough, heartless calls that Caitlin has to make or other characters yeah. have to make. She's like, she's making these mistakes about always trying to save Jinx and always trying to save Vander and always trying to like, she's trying to get this family back and she's absolutely relentless about it, despite the logic telling her not to. And I think that that's a good thing, despite how frustrating it is as a viewer. And it leads to like the, the end where um, Jinx has to save her. And then the two of them are over the edge of this uh, chamber. And Jinx takes the um, hex gem out of her gauntlets and just depowers right. it. So that it falls to her. It's not her death. Cause they obviously there's a like to be continued sort of situation at the end. It was very cloud city, Luke Skywalker falling into like the, the pit. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and you have to, you have to be paying attention to catch it, but, at the end, Caitlin is looking over the blueprints for that chamber. And there's mm -hmm. all these vents that lead off into different exits, like exhaust vents, just like in Cloud City. And, and so there's little hints that Jinx survived, including the airship that drifts away into the distance at the end. There's like that flash of like kind of graffiti kind of noise over the top of it just like at the last second it's very similar yeah, to the yeah. end of batman v superman where they bury superman and then the dirt hovers for a couple of frames before they cut to black there's that and then there's a line that powder says in the very first episode she sees one of those airships and she's like someday i'm gonna ride away on one of those oh yeah and, yeah and so like you get that kind of bookend at the end of of season two uh, and then Silco in the vision that Jinx has when she's in jail with all of her hair untangled, like she's got her, it's a really beautiful shot with all of her hair unbraided. And um, she sees Silco and Silco says like the only way to really end it is to walk away as opposed to taking action to try and fix things. Right. You have to take in, like inaction is what needs to happen. You need to walk away from all of it. And so I think that's probably what what happened and again because of the iconic nature of jinx vi caitlin i don't think that they would kill them in that show i don't think jinx would die at the end of this i think that would be a disservice to the ip and they might have more jinx stories to tell and if jinx appears heavily in the riot mmo then like they don't want to they don't want to kill those characters off i'm sure true yeah i i thought that they might kill her off just or I, I thought they might kill off one of the main ones just because and then it feels like so, like a lot of the big characters that they introduced in season one there were a lot of them that did not make it i mean you get heimerdinger who didn't make it jace didn't make it victor didn't make it and Bessa didn't make it i mean she wasn't one of the original ones but so there were a lot of them that didn't survive but the main ones that we did care about all survived or I should say the main ones that I cared about, they all survived. Mm. We got Mel, we got Vi, we got Jinx, and we got Echo. Like those ones, to me, are the big ones that I, I, I would have been crushed if any one of those, crushed as you can be watching a TV show, but I would have been crushed if any one of those were were killed off. And I, but I feel like the fact that they all made it is a little too clean, given everything that was going on in that. Mm. So like I'm I'm torn because I'm not disappointed because you know my favorite five made it, but at the same time it felt like there would have been. Or at least if one of them got a little bit more, you know, didn't come through quite as unscathed other than Caitlin's eye and Echo's hurt feelings. <laughs> they, they come out with emotional scars, but not necessarily all having physical, physical scars. I, I think that, um, especially when they showed the other way that Heimerdinger dies, when they show like the little 
blood and fur flying around when Echo is like, it's four <laughs> seconds. It's only four seconds. I watched some highlight clips and stuff and uh, Heimerdinger just vanishes. He doesn't necessarily die. They just, he kind of poofs. And it's not the yeah. same kind of poof as the Hextech um, scientist that has like a, a, a shadow on the wall from where he was vaporized. It really feels more like a flash of light poof for Heimerdinger. So yeah. I, I don't necessarily think that he's dead either. Cause I think again, like it's such an iconic character and, and he's part oh, of like okay. this weird, like fairy realm. I can't remember the name of their, their region, but there's a region in, in Rune Terra that's, um, all of the characters and peoples of that realm are like fairy, like, or elf, like, or, um, they have some sort of, um, ethereal kind of vibe. Uh, and so I think that he's part of that and I, so I wouldn't be surprised if he comes back at some point. I agree with you. I think that it, there's there's a lot of characters that that I like that made it as well, and I I hope that Jace is dead because like I don't like Jace. I I don't think that <laughs> I don't like Jace in season two at all. I think it was a horrible storyline. Like this is like one of the main storylines where I'm just kind of like nope. Like so much of the other ones are like, hey, there's a little bit of questionable here and there, but I'm still on board hundred percent love, you know, and really like the show. But I was, I was annoyed whenever Jace was on screen. I just, I found it convoluted. It's a waste of time and, and just so there's time loops. And I just found that they didn't do a really good job explaining to you how long Jace was in his universe to go that crazy yeah. and change that much emotionally. And it just, it was a bunch of cutscenes, and it just did not do the job of communicating what he was supposed to be going through emotionally. So it just felt really out of place, really out of character. Uh, Cause yeah. he was like the, you know, the golden boy in season one. And, uh, and again, it also combines him as a character. I'm not liking in season two with the plot point that I don't like in season two, which is the anomaly and how weird all that stuff is. And mm. it leads into Victor saving the day with good feelings. Like it reminds me of the end of Harry Potter where I'm just like, eh, I, it's not really my, my thing. It's not my favorite resolution to fighting the bad guy. I mean, that leads me into my, my biggest complaint, which is I, I found Victor to be too omniscient, too all powerful. It was too, Skynet from Terminator to Brainiac from Superman to Ultron from Marvel. It just, it got mm. very, I have seen this a hundred times before. And just because they're clockwork robot zombies doesn't mean they're not zombies. It, it just, it felt okay. way over the top. And when I say too powerful, I don't necessarily mean just Victor, but like even the, the white robot things that he was like sending into battle, like all they have to do is touch you and you're screwed that like none of your abilities, skill level, anything matter. All that matters is how fast you are and how lucky you are. And so it, mm. all the character development and cool stuff that we've watched up to this point just didn't matter because everybody, including our heroes all got touched in the face uh, and hung up by light strings by their eyeballs. And it was just kind of hard to watch everybody lose so easily it really felt like a lot of the work that you'd done in the season just wasn't worth it until mm. Jace gives him a hug and they disappear and does some glowy light ball and Victor undoes what he does. Like it just, it's, it feels like such a weird scape, not a scapegoat. It's not the right word for it, but it just, it seems like it's um, by chance. Like you're just Victor basically won. And the only reason he didn't is because he changed his mind. And that just felt, like kind of wishy-washy to me. It didn't feel victorious. It felt like y'all are just lucky. And that, that to me was not my favorite thing. I didn't mind it. I, I feel like it was, it should have been for a different show. hundred percent. Yeah. But, but I, I actually didn't mind it because it, it sort of, it felt like, a, I know I made the joke about multiverse of madness earlier, but it did feel a little Dr. Strangey to me where in, um, was it end game or, the one where Dr. Strange is sitting there and he's looking through all the different possibilities, look through like 14 billion or 14 million different possibilities. And there was only one successful outcome. So this reminded me of that in a bit where he basically, like Victor's basically 
the only one that's been alive in his reality, like in so many realities. And through all of the tests, Jace is the only one that was actually able to kind of create the situation to come back and actually show, you know, show, um, I guess, present day Victor what happens to future Victor. And that's that's when he decides to unravel it. So I, I, I did find that part interesting, but it, it felt like it was such a convoluted add on to what I wanted from the story. So I, I kind of liked it. It just felt like it was in the wrong show personally. Anyway, it was, uh, I didn't, I didn't mind it. So like when they, when they showed like they did the sequence showing Victor giving Jace different ruin stones, but basically he's gone through this so many times trying to figure, you know, found that Jace is the one who's going to be able to show this, but he had actually had to give Jace so many different rune stones to actually create the right timeline for him to show him the right thing to make him undo it. So I kind of didn't mind that. They get into this weird loop where like future Victor giving past Jace stones, that stone is what makes Victor in the first place. Yeah. If he doesn't do the experiment, then Victor doesn't exist. So one of the best ways to make sure that the future doesn't happen is don't give Jace any stones at all, ever, because Jace is the one that gives Victor the stones. That's interesting. Yeah. That's what I mean with these time loops. Like, and that's why I don't generally like shows that mess with time and or alternate universes because it just really gets convoluted quickly. And there's, because of the infinite possibilities, there's also infinite solutions. And usually the fastest solution means that just don't make the show. Like if you just don't do the thing, (laughs) then we don't have to worry about the plot. The only time I think that it's ever been really well explained is when they give themselves rules, like in Back to the Future. And that trilogy only works because it doesn't work the way that time actually works. And I mean, anybody that's around today will, that wants to be, you know, nitpicky about how time travel would technically work, then it wouldn't work like it does in that show. But if it did, Mm -hmm. it would make for a really boring movie. And so I I think that that's, that's where I find that it's worked in some situations in the past. I mean, Terminator, you could argue, argue that Terminator did time travel. Okay. As well. But I I feel like the, the way that they handle it in this, it just, I, I, I think it's a victim of the way that the show tells certain parts of the story very quickly Mm. with a lot of flashy flashbacks or sequences. Yeah. Doesn't give you a lot of exposition. And I feel like this is one of those situations where a lot of exposition was needed and they didn't have a season three to give it to you. That's, I think, one of the other beefs I have with the the way that things unfolded in act three. Act three could have been a season three, but it got squished. Yes. Into. 100%. Into act three. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it felt like so out of pace, out of context. And as you said, like it felt like it could have been in a different show Um, because it just didn't, it didn't fit with like act one and act two. I I don't think, I mean, that's one of those things where like it still gets points for being different. Oh yeah. It, it, you know, it could have been a fist fight between the good guys and the bad guys up to the very end and the good guys win like that. And we've seen that before in Marvel and Superman and all that kind of stuff. So like it does get points for going outside the box for me. Um, I just, I didn't know or didn't realize how weirdly heady in (laughs) sci-fi this show was. So, I mean, hats off to them. I'm really curious to see what they're going to do next. I am definitely interested in riot properties, like, you know, any kind of story they're going to tell, whether it's a book or whether it's a comic or whether it's a video game. I would love a RPG, like an action RPG video game, you know, like God of War or Spider-Man or like one of those games but set in Rune Terra. I think that would be a really cool story to, to, to partake in uh, and, and mm. something that would be a really fun visual world too. Like I'm thinking about how visually unique the Borderlands games are and how visually unique Arcane is. And if you could do something where you can have your own style, don't mimic Borderlands, but like have your own kind of like style. Uh, I mean, think about how if Arcane as an art style and the way that this show looks, with the painted textures and stuff was a like part of a video game. Like if that's how the video game looked. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Obviously with graphics suitable for modern egg video games, not obviously as, as high def as, as what we've seen in the show, but like that would be just so much fun, so much color and contrast and fun action and classical animation explosions over like the CG stuff. It would just be a wild, fun, fun ride. 
Moving into the Internet Minute, the Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you are getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server that's shared with my personal Discord server. And you get access to the Barista Bonus Cut audio sessions whenever we have a chance to record those. Special thanks to Bean Counter Patrons Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support on this episode. Patron count is at 23, which is down one from the last time we recorded. Our goal each time we sit down is to have one more patron. If you would like to be patron number 24, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. I have been just a little bit too busy this week. I did not grab an internet pick, but I see that you did. For me this week, it's... Uh... You know, Steve and the App Hunters at it again. I I used to have one on my computer called Intermission, and basically it, it makes you take uh, a break. It forces you to take a, an eye break from your computer screen every 20 minutes so that the screen goes blurry, a message comes up that says, look away. Anyone who's seen one of my streams know that that's something that <laughs> I struggled with on a regular basis. I'd forget to turn it off in midstream. Everything would just go blank and it says, look away. So, But there's a, a new one that's actually, the app is actually called Look Away. So m- my problem with it, is that at work, it, it used to show up in the middle of meetings when I'm doing screen sharing. And it was always, when it was just my team, it was embarrassing, but it was funny. But now that I'm, I'm actually in a different role now, I professionally just wasn't working out. So this new one actually will register when your camera's on. And so it will it will not kick in when it can tell that you're in a call. So nice. it essentially does what the previous one does. Blurs the screen and every 20 to 30 minutes, you can set your preference. And it just sort of prompts you to look away, like look for 20, every 20 minutes or 20 seconds, look 20 feet or more away to give your eyes just that, that break from staring at something that's so close to you. So it's, um, it does pretty much what the previous app did, but it's a lot less jarring, a lot gentler, nicer notifications and things, and, um, removes the strain from my eyes whenever I have to work. I highly recommend it. I have a moderator reminder built into my streams it just happens sometimes whether i'm i'm paying attention or not uh they uh, <laughs> they often remind me and i uh, will uh lately use the tts stickers to remind me about breaks which is very funny because it's like it 100 gets my attention because it's like an audio cue in in my ear uh, to the point where i've actually been looking into uh getting a a stream bot where i could use the the bot to allow moderators or other situations to trigger some audio in the stream and one of those would be like an audio break reminder because uh sweet sandy and cosmic will use like a highlighted text in chat to say hey you're at an hour like consider taking a break right and they know that i want them to do that like i really appreciate it but i don't always see it especially if I'm like in the throes of designing something in Minecraft where I'm trying to balance something in satisfactory and an audio cue would be helpful. Also, uh, my cam link has taken to freezing. And so the camera will freeze from time to time. And Mm -hmm. I will sometimes pop up graphics or spreadsheets on the screen to illustrate what I'm doing or references that I'm using and then forget to take them down. And so the chat would be just like, can't see what you're doing. Like, just right. you can't see. And I'm playing the video game and I'm not paying attention. And so to have an audio cue that says, you should take the thing off your screen, Joel. We can't see around the image of Devastator. It's like, <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. I've got the spreadsheet up or I've got the image up. I should take that down. But that's cool that, you know, you can get something like this that will help you help you look away. I tend to just like set a timer on my phone. Like when I'm streaming, I only take a break once an hour. At home, I tend to take a break either once an hour or once a half an hour. I will often have something else going on. Like I'll be doing dishes in the other room or I have laundry downstairs I have to get. And I find that that tends to give me the the break that I need. But uh, I do remember not taking breaks like that when I was doing a lot of art because I get so sucked into it. I think you can probably speak to that too. Oh yeah. When you're really in a groove artistically and you're working on something, whether it's design or illustration or cartooning or whatever, like when you're in the zone, you don't want to get up because you're worried you're going to leave the zone. <laughs> and yeah. and I find that you end up not taking a break when you should. And then for me in design, it's like, especially with the logo designs and stuff like that, I, I've basically zoomed in to 6,000% on Adobe Illustrator and then I've leaned into my screen again. So it's like, I'm probably barely blinking six inches away from my screen, which is not healthy. So this very helpful for my line of work. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that Stephen and I talked about at the citadelcafe.com. 
Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email the show at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or follow the show by name on social media. Subscribe for free on all of the major podcasting platforms. That includes YouTube. The RSS feed is available on our website. And of course, the patron only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. It's free. Just tell a friend about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything that I'm doing online at joelduggan.com. That includes a link to my other podcast, The Spawn Chunks, all about Minecraft. And The Garden Awakens just dropped this week. So we will have a new Minecraft update to talk about on Monday's show. So tune in for that. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Tuesday through Saturday right now, focusing on Minecraft on the weekends and Satisfactory during the week. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on and talking about Arcane. This was really, really fun. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad that we can find these shows that we've both watched and uh, have both enjoyed. I know we had some things to Mm -hmm. nitpick about it today, but I feel like there's been a couple occasions this year where it's been just really nice to have something that we've both loved and both wanted to talk about. Uh, And it's uh, it's a lot easier when we've both seen the same thing because then you're not worried about spoiling the other, of course. Yeah, exactly. You've been listening to The Citadel Cafe where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two. (laughs) 